everyone, welcome back to another video where today we're going to be talking about the latest Doctor Who news, including a brand new interview from Shooty Gatwa. We're going to be talking over the Doctor Who Star Beast premiere, as well as early reviews. We've got quite a few things to go over today, so make sure you sit down, stay comfortable, subscribe. I'm trying to bring you all the latest and greatest Doctor Who news as soon as I can. I will say though, obviously, Doctor Who magazine is out for some people. In fact, you might see it on my desk behind me there. I am not going to be covering the Doctor Who magazine stuff until tomorrow because I want to at least give a chance for people to go out and buy the magazine before I go talking about all the little details in a video tomorrow. And even then, I don't tend to show the magazine on screen just to be safe. But with that said, let's get right into it. So yeah, Shuti Gatwa did an interview for GQ magazine and look at these pictures, man. First of all, I mean, damn, they got him on Gallifrey for this photo shoot. I mean, that's method if I've ever seen it. Really, really cool pictures to start off with. But I wanted to highlight some key quotes in here because I've read the whole article. It's fully worth your time. I would highly suggest going and reading the article in full if you have the opportunity to. But I wanted to pick out a couple of key quotes that really stood out to me. And I want to thank Bad Wolf Archives for compartmentalizing. I ask how else Gatwa would describe his iteration of the Doctor. All of a sudden, he gets distracted. And I wonder if he might be feigning distraction to avoid the question. I ask him again, and he looks up at me and grins. I would describe the Doctor as a black man. I think that's just really nice. I think it's nice to see that he identifies with the character. And yeah, that just made me smile. But we also have this quote about a pivotal moment in episode 5 of series 14. Shooty hints in GQ that his first film scene was a pivotal moment in his series. The final scene in episode 5. People will remember that scene. I remember thinking, you have to dig deep and pull out everything and blow everyone away. And I bloody well did. And then they, they go on to say that someone else said, and that's why he's the Doctor. So incredibly curious to see what this scene was. It's mental to think that he was filming like an episode five like climax scene as his first scene. I can imagine that being a pretty like high pressure situation to start off your career as the Doctor with. But as you guys know, I'm incredibly excited to see Shooty Gatwa's take on the Doctor. And yeah, I absolutely just can't wait to see it. New provisional schedules for the 25th of November indicate that Doctor Who Star Beast will air 6.30 p.m. on BBC One, followed by Strictly at 7.30 p.m. This could still change. The full schedules will be released on Friday. So yeah, this isn't 100% confirmed, but we know that Strictly Come Dancing airs at 7.30, and according to Doctor Who production news here, the weakest link is on at 5.45. It is an hour slot, which is perfect for Doctor Who. So it seems increasingly likely that 6.30pm is the slot in which we are going to be seeing Doctor Who return on Saturdays in less than a few weeks. I'm so excited. 6.30 is a very good slot as well. Prime time on a Saturday where Doctor Who belongs. The Blue Peter competition winner is going to be revealed on the 24th of November at 5pm. As well as that, we've had confirmation that the 75-minute omnibus edit of the Daleks that's going to be in colour will air on BBC4 at 7.30pm on the 23rd of November, and it will be followed by a repeat of an adventure in space and time. And I would assume that's the reason why we haven't seen it on the iPlayer yet, is because they were holding it back for this 23rd double billing of Doctor Who goodness. Yeah, I'm super excited to see this Dalek colorization. Obviously, the original story is fantastic, but I'm interested to see what cuts they made, what changes they made, and I think it's just going to let us see the story in a brand new way. And then having Adventure in Space and Time to follow, I mean, I don't need to tell you guys how wonderful an Adventure in Space and Time is. I absolutely adore it, have done since it came out. I've watched it so many times. Possibly, and I say this without a hint of hyperbole, one of my favourite like autobiographical films ever made. I think it's so well done. And David Bradley's performance as William Hartnell is so emotional. On the topic of an adventure in space and time, Mark Gattis recently had an interview with Radio Times saying that a documentary about Trial of a Time Lord would be an absolutely fantastic piece of work in relation to a possible an adventure in space and time sequel. It's a strange thing to say, but the darkest hour of the show would definitely make a very interesting drama, wouldn't it? I mean, the personal conflicts, the professional conflicts, the resignations, that's the one, isn't it? And I suppose out of the darkness comes the light. I personally would love a sequel to An Adventure in Space and Time. And I do think that's an incredibly interesting one to go for, because unlike with An Adventure in Space and Time that had obviously the humbling rise of Doctor Who, as well as the departure of William Harnell, this would be a lot more of a turbulent 
phase in the show's history, all things considered. I mean, Doctor Who's always turbulent, but that time especially, you know, with the hiatus and then obviously the truncated episodes with Trial of Time Lord, Colin, you know, being forced to leave shortly afterwards. It's a very, very interesting time in the show's history. I'd love to see that. Mark Gatiss, I think, does incredible work with these, and I'd love to see another one. So I'm really hoping that maybe... I don't know, maybe in the next couple of years we could get another one. That would be a great addition to the universe, I think. We've also had confirmation that the Doctor Who Bargain Hunt crossover airs on the 23rd of November, 12.15pm. Yeah, like, they are really going all out with Doctor Who-themed programming across the BBC. Not to mention there's probably a ton more radio broadcasts I've missed. Yeah, gotta hand it to the BBC. They are really going all out to celebrate Doctor Who's birthday and I appreciate it immensely. Speaking of people I appreciate immensely, Russell T. Davis posted this on Instagram, back in studio at Bad Wolf for Series 15 filming, saying, back to work, and you can see the TARDIS is behind him. Now, we've seen that there is some outdoor filming for what we assume is the 2024 Christmas battle, but I'd assume, given this Instagram post, that this is likely the first piece of studio shooting for Series 15 today, which is incredibly exciting. It's still mental that they're that far ahead. You know, we've not even seen the 60th yet. They've already finished Series 14 all Season 1 and Series 15 all Season 2. Not quite gotten used to that yet. Doctor Who magazine has had its cover reveal, and as well, as I say, I have had a flick through. I will say, whenever you get the opportunity to pick this one up, this is probably the most comprehensive Doctor Who magazine I've seen in years, dare I even say ever. It's got so many cool, interesting details, interviews. The one thing I will say, I really actually quite like the cover art for the subscriber edition. I do think that the standard edition, the art is a little bit clustered. I think there's a lot of text. However, I do like using the diamond pattern for the diamond logo. I think that's really nice. And I hope they keep that as a sort of motif going. But still a nice cover, nice picture of David and Catherine, new pictures of Toymaker and the Meep, good stuff. We had a new Who Spy image, this time seeming to depict the workshop of John Logie Baird, who we've spoken about previously, is the guy who created TV. And yeah, it definitely looks like that given all the different pieces of contraptions. That looks like an old film reel over there. We've had some better pictures of Nicola Colgan on the festive special set for 2024. As you can see here, yeah, it's definitely her. This is from Click News Media and then was made into an article by The Mirror. Very excited to see her. Obviously, you guys know her from Dairy Girls. I haven't seen that, but you guys all tell me she's wonderful and I have no reason to doubt you. Russell T. Davis was posting pictures with all of the Doctor Who alumni at the Doctor Who premiere, and he posted this picture with one Carol Ann Ford. Now, it's interesting that Carol Ann Ford, in particular, was at this event, because every other Doctor Who alumni, if you like, who was at the premiere, has been involved in Doctor Who recently in some capacity. They had Sophie Aldred and Sylvester McCoy, who'd both done Tales of the TARDIS, as was the case for, I believe, Colin Baker, Nicola Bryant was also there, Daniel Anthony, who plays Clyde and Joe Grant were there, and probably some others. What I'm saying is all of them have been back in Doctor Who in some capacity who were, who were at this event. The only person who doesn't fit that description is Caroline Ford, who played Susan, the Doctor's granddaughter, all the way back in 1963. So this has got a lot of people speculating, are we going to be seeing a return of Susan finally after all these years? Now, there was some talk of some new scenes being filmed for the Daleks, if you remember. So I'm wondering if they'll do a Tales of the Tardis thing for that release with Caroline Ford as Susan, or the more out there option is... As has been speculated before, she makes an appearance in the 60th anniversary. Now, I can't say that for definite, because we don't know. But given that we already kind of know that Mel's back, I don't think Susan coming back is out of the question. Especially given that there seems to be a lot of trippy things that the toy maker manipulates the Doctor with and kind of uses to gain the emotional upper hand against the Doctor, according to the trailers. And what better way could the toy maker have to really get inside the Doctor's head than to dangle the one person he left behind after all those years in front of him and really torment him with that. I think that would be a fascinating thing. Obviously, it would work too, because obviously, while Susan didn't meet the Toymaker, the Toymaker is a 60s villain, so it'd be a really cool little tie in there. Again, I'm just theorising, but I'd love to see Caroline Ford back in the main show. It's one of those untied loose ends of Doctor Who that I feel like really needs 
to have its resolution. You know, if we've had talks about Adric and we've had the Seventh Doctor and Ace reconcile on screen following the cancellation of the show and basically saying what happened there, I think the one thing we need now from the classic series is a resolution for Susan. I know Big Finish have done their own versions, but obviously it's different on TV. You know what I mean? And I wanted to talk about this. This is the first review of the Star Beast from Nev Fountain, who was at the premiere. Mr. Russell T. Davis faultlessly weaves together the plot of a classic comic strip with all of the elements that make his Who great. Bags of charm, wit and emotion that never drops the ball for a second. An absolute joy from the first to the last. That's a great review, if ever I've heard one. And it's made me incredibly excited for all the episodes. Obviously, I've read the original Beep for Meep story, and it is actually a very Russell T. Davis Doctor Who story, with a very family-friendly quality to it and a very grounded element to it. So I can totally see why he chose to adapt that one. And it also has such a spirit of fun in there as well. So I'm incredibly excited to see it. And also, obviously, at the premiere, there were some absolutely fantastic pictures. You had Beep the Meep on display, security guards, you have like a photo booth thing, but also something I want to talk about briefly were across the venue, there were these weird stuffed animals that were basically seeming to recreate monsters from Doctor Who. Obviously there was a nude one, an adipose one, but weirdly there was also one of the, I think, test lectures from one of the Matt Smith episodes. Now, there has been a lot of speculation that these are toys that Yasmin Finney has built, but the interesting thing is, how would she have the knowledge to build these things? Obviously, they could exist within Donna Noble's subconscious and therefore transpose onto Rose, you know, to the genetic line. She might get some of that imagination from her mother's experience. Or what I like as a theory is that Wilfred was the one to tell her these bedtime stories about these monsters and her mum having adventures, and she just thought they were fun little fictional stories. Very 11th Doctor and Amy Pond in that way. I personally love that idea, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. But that's about all I wanted to talk about today. Tomorrow, you'll be getting my Doctor Magazine coverage. Things are really heating up. Be sure to like the video if you enjoyed, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you later.